Man, you guys, you did a good job. Thank you very much, Alita. Thank you so much. Keep your Bibles open to Ephesians 5, and let's look at that verse again. It's going to be Ephesians 5, verses 1 and 2. What does it mean to be an imitator? Any ideas? Try to duplicate the original. I like that. Try to duplicate the original. So, if it says, therefore, be imitators of God as dear children, what does that mean? Paul answers that in verse 2. To be imitators of God, we need to walk in love, as Christ also has loved us and given himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling aroma. Um, last week, we talked about... the peacemaking responses and we went through these here first one overlooking an offense we looked at the Bible verses for it reconciliation negotiation and that's where I want to start this morning is negotiation let's turn to Philippians chapter 2 verse 4 Philippians 2, verse 4. Ray, do you have that? Yes. Can you read that for us? Look not every man on his own thing, but every man also on the things of others. What does that verse actually say? Any ideas? Well, in the New, New King James, it you says... you want to read that? Let each of you look out only, not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. I, I like the way that's said. So... How does that verse help us in negotiation? Any ideas? And we're talking about negotiating conflict. When you're negotiating conflict, and if you're negotiating with the person you're in conflict with, the first thing you have to do is not just look out for your own interests. But if you want to come to reconciliation, you have to look out for the interests of that person that you're in conflict with. Now, is that an easy thing to do? No. Is that a natural thing to do? No. This is why you must be imitators of God. Is that not what God does? Mm -hmm. Let me ask you a question. Are we in conflict with God when we sin and outside of Christ? Yes. By the way, I added that last part. That question a lot easier to answer. Okay. Outside of Christ, do you have a conflict with God? The answer is yes. And outside of Christ, does God have a conflict with you? And the answer is yes. And that conflict is sin, right? So, who was it that made reconciliation? Was it you that reconciled yourself to God, or was it God who reconciled himself with you? Okay, God is the one that did it all. So, God was the one who brought reconciliation to the human race, and he did it through Jesus Christ. How did he do that? He did that by looking out for our best interests. Now, if you were running a company, and you had 100 employees, and 100 employees turned against you, would you keep those employees? Would it be in your best interest to keep those employees? This is what God did. God took us who rebelled against Him and reconciled us to Him. Amen. It's like having that company and all your employees turn against you and you keep them all. Not only do you keep them, but you work to bring them back into reconciliation. Do you understand that? That is what God has done for us. And since God has done that for us, God asked us to do that with each other. So if you're going to be able to work through conflict, the first one, as we looked at, is the easiest way for minor conflicts, even to right up to severe, sometimes it's best to overlook an offense. If 
you can't overlook it, then we got to deal with reconciliation. And in the process of reconciliation, there comes a point in time when we may need to have negotiations. Now, if you have a knock on your door, and there's a person that says, I represent your long lost uncle. He has died and the will is about to be read. And you must meet at this place at this time because your name is in the will. Okay? When that will is read, it explains what is to be done with this uncle's property and how he wants it to be given out. Is that right? Now, how many of you have had conflict within the family when it came to death in the family and the reading of the will or the giving out of personal assets. Anybody experience that? Raise your hand. Okay. This is the reason why you have a will because if there's a will, it's a whole lot easier to have the final wishes taken care of. But if there is no will, then it can go into probate. And you will definitely need negotiation. Okay? Within the church, sometimes there's conflict that arises within the church and that the two parties or all of the parties involved cannot work that conflict out. You've gone through the biblical procedures of it's a process that you can't overlook. It has to be dealt with. So you try to bring reconciliation. You've gone to the party, you've expressed your concern, you've expressed your uh, desire to bring reconciliation, and it doesn't work out. You just can't come to terms. What do you do then? Well, the Bible is clear, is that at that point, you need negotiation. And this is where, if it's between two people or a group of people, and you try to work this out between yourselves, without involving everybody else, and it doesn't work out between yourselves, then you involve the church. You can involve the elders, you can involve uh, the deaconesses, you can involve the pastor, okay? And you try to negotiate terms, right? Paul says in 1 Corinthians, that there was situations in the church where brothers were taking brothers to court and they were going before an unbelieving judge to settle disputes. Paul said, you shouldn't do this. Isn't there anybody within the church that can work these things out? Paul made it clear that you should get a person who is considered the least in stature in the church to work out these problems before you go to a judge. So, if there's conflict that arises within the church structure, and you try to work it out amongst yourself, and you can't do that, that's when you involve other members of the church. But it should only be a small group at first. And that in that negotiation process, you can have mediation. You guys know what that means, mediation? When you do mediation, you bring the parties together, person that is there as a mediator, or persons, they have no authority to make you do anything. They're there to give you options, and to give you ideas, and try to bring you to one accord. But how does that happen? It will not happen if you go into these situations only looking for your best interest. You have to do what the scripture said, and that is to look to the interest of others. And in this situation, if you have a problem with your brother or your sister, who is the other that's the person you're supposed to look out for their interest first? Brothers. It would be them, right? So understand what Christ calls for is not an easy thing, and it goes against your fallen human nature. Okay? But if you take these verses and you understand what Christ has done for you 
and what Christ has done in you, it's easier with the help of the Holy Spirit to be reconciled to your brother, to your sister, or even to your church. What happens when you don't just have a problem with an individual at the church, but you actually have a problem with the church? How do you bring reconciliation into those areas? Philippians 2, 3, let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind, let each other esteem the other person better than themselves. What does that mean? That means that we are to, number one, humble ourselves. Is that right? And in humility, look to bring reconciliation to the conflict and the problems that we have. Now, let's say you have a problem with the entire church. How do you bring reconciliation in those situations? And if done properly, you can... situations if there's a problem with the entire church it would usually be the, the church board or the authorities within the church then you should go to them first and have the opportunity to discuss your issues, differences, problems or conflicts okay? um, if you don't want to go by yourself, then you have every right to bring somebody else with you. What you don't have the right to do is try to politic before you go into this meeting to get those people to take your sides. Because what you're doing there is now splitting the church. You understand? And that is what you try to not do. This is why when you have conflict, you keep that conflict within the smallest amount of people as possible. Because when you start telling others, people will take sides. And then that conflict grows, and it's harder to contain, and it's harder to bring reconciliation. Does that make sense? Amen. Okay. I like this one. I'll put this up. Anger. Anger is just one letter short of what? Danger. To be little is to be little. I like that. Proverbs 16, 24. You guys want to turn to that? Proverbs 16, 24 says, Pleasant words are like a honeycomb, sweetness to the soul, and health to the bones. Talked about this one already. Proverbs 15, 1. That is, a soft answer will turn away wrath, but grievous words stir up anger. Now, when you get to this point of negotiation, you're talking about assisted peacemaking. Mediation, okay? Get this real quick. Let's look at a couple of these verses. Let's look at Matthew chapter 18, verse 16. Matthew 18, verse 16. It says, Actually, let's start at verse 15. Moreover, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he hears you, you have gained your brother. Verse 16, but if he will not hear you, take with you, how many? One or two more, that by the mouth of two witnesses, two or three witnesses, every word may be established. So, assisted peacemaking is when you try to go one-on-one, -on -one, it doesn't work, and you need to bring somebody else with you. Okay? So you go bring somebody else with you, that's mediation. And with the other people there, you try to, once again, work out your differences. If that works, that is great. If that doesn't work,
But if he will not hear you, take with you one or two more witnesses, that by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word may be established. Verse 17, if he refuses to hear them, then you do what? You tell it to the church. Okay? And if he refuses to even hear the church, then what happens? It says, let him to be to you like a heathen or a tax collector. Conflict can be handled within the church structure. And it can be handled in a way that shows mercy, grace, and God's power. Okay? But it can only be done if we humble ourselves and if we have the Spirit of Christ on both sides of the conflict. Okay? Arbitration. Let's look at 1 Corinthians 6.4. chapter that, that Paul is very clear and very plain and he doesn't mince his words to the church at Corinth and he tells them why are you doing this okay um, 6.4 is one we want to focus on but let me give you a little detail and let's go to 6.1 dare any of you having a matter against another go to law before the unrighteous and not before the saints do you not know that the saints will what Judge the world. And if the world will be judged by you, are you unworthy to judge the smallest of matters? Do you not know that we shall judge angels? How much more than the things that pertain to this life? If then you have judgments concerning things pertaining to this life, do you appoint those who are least esteemed, that's what I was talking about, by the church to judge? What's Paul saying here? Paul says that instead of going before an unrighteous judge, you can go before the least esteemed within the church and they can judge for you and they'll judge better than an unrighteous judge. But, for this to happen, you've got to be able to actually um, trust the people in the church. Right? This is why this is called a church family. Is that right? And for these principles to work, the church has to work the way it's supposed to. That means you have to have a relationship that God has called you to have with your brothers and your sisters. And it's got to be more than just surface deep. It's got to have some type of root. Okay, so that would be arbitration. And now let's look at accountability. Turn back to Matthew chapter 18. Matthew 18, and let's look at verse 17. Matthew 18, verse 17 says, If he refuses to hear them, tell it to the church. But if he refuses even to hear the church, let him be to you like a heathen and a tax collector. Accountability. Can you really have reconciliation if there is no accountability among the, uh, the, the people within the conflict? Can you really have a walk with God if there's no accountability on your part in your relationship with Him? Why do you think the church actually has standards? Because there's got to be accountability. Accountability for the church members to act in such a way that they don't bring a bad impression upon God, upon His people, and upon His church. There's got to be personal accountability. When we go to court today, you hire a lawyer to represent you, is that right? Now that lawyer doesn't care whether you're innocent or whether you're guilty, whether you're the one at fault or whether you're innocent. If you tell the man you're innocent, then that's what he's going to uh, represent you as. You can be the most guilty person who's walked this planet, and if you hire that lawyer, he's going to represent you as being innocent. This is the problem with taking believers to court. It does not bring out the truth, and the truth that's brought out is always tainted to one side. 
a court is made to look on one side. The, the court is made and is set up, that's a better word. The court is set up to make one side look really good and the other side look really bad. Right? And so when it comes to the plaintiff, his attorney gets up and makes him look really good and makes the other person look really bad. Well, when the other person gets to stand up, his lawyer does the same thing. Very little truth goes on in court. Has anybody here ever actually been to court? Okay? The court system is not a, not a good thing. It's the best, I guess, that we have, but the church should be better. Why should the church be better? Any we're ideas? Based, we're based on God's love. Right. Okay, we're based on God's love. What else? Is that the only reason? Mercy. We should be able to show mercy. Okay? Uh, should we not also reflect the character of Christ, whether we're the plaintiff or the defendant? If we have a problem with a brother or a sister, should we not, and we're in conflict, represent Christ even within that conflict? Now what happens if Ray and I are on the church board and I want to paint the church purple because it's not my favorite color? And Ray goes, nah, I don't like that idea, we need to keep it white. And I go, no man, we, it's been white for uh, as long as the church has been here, let's paint it purple. It's a good idea. New, fresh, Detroit young people. So Ray and I have this continued conflict over the color of the church. Has that ever happened? Has that ever happened to the point where that conflict got so big it actually split churches? Oh my goodness. Over the color of the walls. Okay? Why? Because I would not back off of my view. Okay? Now if you ask me, I would take in Ray's point of view and I would not want to come into a purple church, but kind of one of the many tools that God will use to help you develop a more Christ-like character. You guys believe that? Okay. To begin with, he may use conflict to remind you of your weaknesses and to encourage you to depend on him more. The more you rely on his grace, wisdom, and power, the more you will be imitating the Lord Jesus Christ. Ray, can you find Luke chapter 22 and read for us verses 41 through 44? Luke 22, verses 41 through 44. God may also use conflict to expose sinful attitudes and habits in your own life. Conflict is especially effective in breaking down appearances and revealing stubborn pride, a bitter and unforgiving heart, or a critical tongue. When you are squeezed through controversy and these sinful characteristics are brought to the surface, you will have an opportunity to recognize their existence and ask for God's help in overcoming them. Right, you have that 41 through 44. That's Luke chapter 22. 